very warm welcome to to all of you to week seven of seven of the python level one course if you're finding this video for the first time this is the seven out of seven sessions where we've covered the core foundations of python today is the last class of the level one foundation cl class where we're looking at files and we'll be going through files and paths and trying to understand how to uh, wrap our minds around that and get a good foundation on how to work with files. I think that files should not be learned on their own, but they should be learned together with paths. So it's important to understand not just how to open files, but how to navigate through the file system and how to access files, how to create files, how to create folders and being able to just understand how to work with files correctly. It's meaningless to just know how to read with work with files and not know um, that there is much more underneath it. We're going to cover a lot of theory in this video. So this is going to be a theory heavy video because we need a good background. And in fact, that's a very good example of what it takes to write good programs. You need to understand the domain. So we'll spend some time understanding the domain by trying to figure out what are files, what are the properties of files, how do we work with files, what are the different types of files, and the the terms that are used in relation to files and paths. We need to understand that correctly so that when we start using files and the path handling within Python, we wouldn't be confused. We'll have a clear idea of what it is we are doing. Okay, so as I said, today is files and paths. Today's the last day. Uh, there are six other videos that come before this. In addition to that, there's also some introductory material to help you get started. So setting up PyCharm, setting up Git and, and uh, GitHub and being able to use PyCharm. I just need to emphasize something here that unlike a lot of other Python courses where they'll teach you how to use Jupyter Notebook or they're going to teach you how to use Visual Studio Code, I think if you're going to work with Python, you want to work with the IDE that's exclusively designed for working with Python, that has Python in mind, that takes into account the future of Python, and PyCharm is a way to do it. So in this course, we don't just learn Python. We don't just learn even PyCharm. We also learn how to use Git and GitHub. There's an ecosystem of tools that work together to help you have to work in a professional way and to work productively. You want to be productive from day one. And that's my aim with this course. So at the end of this, because in this course, what we've been doing is every week we have a set of problems that we work on. So at the end of this video, all the students who are signed up are going to get an email that's got all the content for today. So there are programming challenges and there's a quiz in addition to the slides and, and all the other material. And the assignments, the programming challenges and the quiz are due a week from to today. That is next week on Sunday. Before then, I'm going to post material for the programming challenges for the, the mini project. So there'll be, there'll be one mini project or there'll be, uh, there'll be, I'll prepare a number of them so that you can choose. And this will be just one problem, but it will be significantly harder than what we've worked on on the programming challenges. And it will then incorporate everything. You'll, you'll have to solve a general problem. And it's going to be one week. So there'll be a one week timeline of that within which you need to submit. I think that's sufficient time for, for you to do that. I also want to announce that there's going to be an exciting new course that's going to start very soon. I'm going to announce that. And that's going to be the Python Skill Builder course. Python Skill Builder 1. It's a 10 week course. And it is exactly like the mini project. There are 10 problems over 10 weeks, one problem per week. And the problems are designed to help you explore the standard library, to learn certain skills, to learn how to solve certain problems, to expand your thinking in terms of what you do. If you're interested, please get in touch with me. You could get in touch through the video, the comments at the bottom of this video. But you could also write to me by email if you are signed up in the class. So you could just write a message to me. Let me know that you want to sign up. If you are already signed up for the Python level one course, you are automatically included as one of the students for the Python skill builder course. So I said it's a 10 week challenge. Um, there are 10 challenges, one challenge a week over 10 weeks. 
and this will be like the mini project. The aim of the skill builder is to build your skills, give you more experience, um, writing more uh, useful uh, programs, and to just give you breadth. So what we've worked on through the Python level one course is we've just given you the content itself. So we now know what it takes to write a basic um, Python program, but now we want to expand that and get more experience using the functionality within Python. So that's it for, for that. And let's get started today with files and paths. Okay, so we're just covering two topics, files and paths. So let me just get that started. So let's just start with a quick recap of week six. In week six, what we did was we were looking at uh, functions and the idea behind functions, we, we said there are three reasons why we use functions. We use functions because they help um, organize our code. We don't end up repeating ourselves. They make our code uh, more readable and they make it neat. And there's certain functionality that's only available when we use functions. By going through some of the submissions from last week from the programming challenge, I can say that it seems like those challenges weren't as challenging as week four or week five. And they're relatively straightforward. But if you have any problems, do get in touch with me and, and we can see how to uh, make some progress. So as I said, we have two main parts. I'm going to talk about files and I'm going to talk about paths. And I'm going to discuss that with some um, examples. So we're actually going to go into PyCharm and then work on a number of examples. We're going to work on examples with files and we're going to work on examples with paths. We've been talking about compound statements, if you remember from week five where we introduced if for and while we say that compound statements have a certain structure and there are a number of uh, con compound statements that we've looked at in the course of through this course we started off in week three with a try except and then if for while in week five and then last week we looked at the def today we're looking at with and we're going to see that once we've introduced files as before these compound statements all have the same structure they have a header and a suite so I'm going to repeat that image. If you want to look at that image, go to week five and see the general structure of compound statements. Okay, let's, let's get started. Let's talk about files. Now, what is a file? A file is a way to store data permanently. So I have a typo there, so it's going to be storage, but it's a way to store data. So it's a permanent way of storage. And when you continue working with programs and writing code, you realize that there are many ways that files can be used. And what tends to happen is we think of files ordinarily as what we have on the file system, which has got a typically, it's got a name. And, but over time, you're going to realize that there are many ways that files can be used. But the basics is just what you're familiar with on your operating system. Anytime you create a Word document, Anytime you download a PDF file, that's a file. And it's just a store of data. Files have got certain properties. A file has got a name, which is what by which we identify it. And the name is split into two parts. There's the stem and the extension. We'll look at a little more detail about extensions in the next couple of slides. But if you take the example of a file called image.png, an image.png is a PNG file, which has the stem image and the extension PNG. They are separated by a period or a, a, a full stop. The location of a file, as we shall see in part two, is where the file resides on the file system. Every file has an owner, and the owner doesn't necessarily have to be a human being. The owner could be a process that's running on your operating system. And we'll see how that looks like shortly. Files have permissions. Permissions specify what is allowed on the file. So let's look at that in detail. If you want to work with a file, you will only be able to work on it to the extent that the permissions allow. There are three main permissions associated with a file. You can either read from the file or what we call read only. If it is read only, um, then you can read. You can write to the file, which means you can make changes to the file, and there are different ways you could make changes to a file, not just writing it from scratch, but having write permissions allows you to modify the file, and execute permissions allow you to run it. 
Now, execute permissions only apply in the case where the content of the file is executable. And that applies if it is either a program or a script. And um, let's look at a demo of this right now. Okay. So, I have PyCharm open here. Let me just open... I'll, I'll change the view so that you can see it in presentation mode. And so everything is nice and clear. There we go. And I'm going to open my terminal. Now, as we said, files have permissions. If you want to view the contents of a directory, so this is, we're getting into a bit of uh, Linux commands. I'm doing this for Linux and there are similar commands for, for Windows. I think in Windows you have, um, I think it's DIR. But we are working on Linux and I can encourage you to try and work on Linux if you can because if you end up working with a lot of Python code, you will inevitably be in a Linux environment where you, either you're working with servers or you're uh, writing your own code. And Linux just tends to be the most um, re reliable, or just most available for, for writing code. But if you're on Windows, yes, you could use the dir command to list. So I'm going to list the contents of this directory, ls. I'm not sure if you had seen this before. But if I list the contents of this directory, we'll see that there are a number of files and there is one directory. In my case here, what we have is we have a coloring that helps us distinguish between the files and the folders. The files are just in white and you can see all the files have got an extension. By now you're familiar with the .py extension for Python files. We have an image there which is JPG. We have another a Python file there and we have a text file txt which is called war and peace but now we want to look at the permissions and for us to look at the permissions we need to use the minus l argument for the list command so we're going to list and we're going to modify listing by saying list it in long format now when we list it in long format we can see a lot more information than when we had a simple list we at the beginning we see there a number total uh, I think that total I don't know what that total refers to actually, but uh, if you know, please uh, put a comment in the, the comment in the description of the video below. But what we are interested here right now is the permissions. As we said, every file has got an owner, so that's the third column there. Um, I am the owner, Paul Career. There is also the group. Every owner is part of a group, and by default, that group would be their own self. But in my case, I have that I am a member of the group staff. But what we want to see is the permissions. As we said, there are three permissions. And the way this is defined, they are speci specified in three sets of permissions. The first one specifies that whether this is a file or not a file. So in the first case, the directory has D and that tells us that this is a directory. If you have a dash, then it's just an ordinary file. We have the read, write, and execute permissions, and that set constitutes the owner permissions. So Paul has got read, write, and execute permissions on the directory called. Now, you might ask a question, what does execute do on a directory? Because we have X there. X says that we can open the directory. The next set of permissions are for the group, and the group here, has, the group can read, means anyone who is a member of the group staff can read, but they can't write to this file, but they can't, they can execute this. Since it's a directory, it means they can navigate into the directory. And then the last set is for anyone else who is not the owner and not the group, what we call other. So for other, we have read and execute permissions, which means any user on this computer, whether it's myself, uh, whether who is not myself and not a member of staff, that is any other person, can read and execute this directory, which means they can navigate into this directory. So those are the three permissions that we have. Okay, so that's as, as, as far as we need to go with permissions. Um, I think I skipped a slide here. So yeah, so that's it for permissions. Um, reading, writing, and executing. 
Now there are two main types of files. There are text files and there are binary files. Text files can be viewed, the content is legible. Binary files have got raw binary data. So let's look at that in practice. So with the text file we have here, Python files are text files, as is the war and peace file. So there are a number of things we can do here. We can Con we can rerun the cat command, which does concatenate or just spits out the content of a file. Uh, you could say, uh, so let's, let's use the head command. The head command just shows you what's in the file in the first few lines. So if we say head and we say war and peace, it's going to print out what's in just the head, typically the first 10 lines, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So Project Gutenberg ebook of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy. We can do the same with a text file, head, which is, um, so what other files did we have here? We had files.py, so we can have head files.py. And because the text file, it, it just shows us the content of that. If we try and do the same with a binary file, an image is a binary file. Um, if you say head, image it's going to show us a lot of rubbish because it's not a text file all those are raw binary data which cannot be decoded to something legible which is why it looks like rubbish so it doesn't even know where the the the, the first 10 lines would be okay So I'm going to answer your questions. I see there's a question there, but we're going to, I'm going to answer that question on, later. So I said there are two types of files, text and binary files. Now let's talk about text files. Let's be now more specific. Text files are defined or they are characterized by an encoding. If it is a case that a text file has to be legible, then we have to define the set of characters that we can see or that we can read that make it legible. And the character encoding is very important for that. These days, the default character encoding is UTF-8 um, on most browsers. There are many, many other thousands of encodings. And in one of the exercises, you're going to play around with uh, character encoding. I have an example where the data is in an exotic character encoding, and you'll have to translate it into UTF-8. But you'll have to figure out how to do that. So the character encoding is a very important property of a text file, it determines the legibility of the characters. If you try to view the content of a file which has using the wrong character encoding, you'll, you'll see exactly what you saw with the binary file because the data will be, you know, encoded into binary but in a strange way. In as much as it's a text file, it will not be legible if you use the wrong encoding. So the encoding is an important property of text files. Most of the times if you're working with Python, you never even have to think about it, especially if you're working with English, at least that's what I'm aware of. You never have to think about the character encoding because it's, there's a default that's been set. In a lot of cases, there will be a character encoding specified explicitly. And we might see an example of this when we, we start looking at file formats. So let's talk about binary files. As I said, binary files, it's raw binary data. If, it is, if you want to store numbers as values, you have to use binary data. Um, this is important, um, especially if you're going to do something like doing compression or you want to encode the data into a certain format. Uh, and there, there are other encodings which are not necessarily forms of character encoding. There are other ways of encoding binary data, maybe to make it even look like it is legible. In order for you to work with binary files, you need a schema. A schema, um, which applies not just for binary files, but specifically for binary files, a schema describes how the bytes are arranged. So it might be the case that you want to have a mixture of some strings together with some, some, some numbers, some integers, together with some, some um, uh, float values. Uh, and therefore, you need to specify how many bytes are strings, how many bytes are going to be integers, how many bytes are going to be floats, and so on. 
and you might want to even store the floats in multiple dimensions so if you want to store um let's say three dimensional values where you have every three every set of three floating floating point values um, define one point your schema will need to specify that so the schema set allows the final user to be able to write a program that can read that file and extract the data for use and there's there's a lot of reasons why you might want to use binary files binary files as you said can be compressed they can be encoded in other helpful ways um, but the compression is perhaps the most important property of, of binary files that you can store the, the data already uh, minimized in a lossless way we use binary files all the time pdf files are binary files image files are binary files audio files mp3 mp4 um, movie files are binary files and there are many many other types of binary files zipped files will be binary even if, if the original data was text so binary data is a very important format and it would be very helpful if you can for yourself to if you could learn how to work with binary files the last two programming challenges will get you started with binary files they're, they're quite straightforward they're not uh, exotic and difficult but they will show you how to work with binary files and then ask you to do a, a couple of tasks Okay, now let's talk about file formats. We know file formats by the extension. As we said, a file name has got two parts, a stem and an extension. A file format is just a generic way to organize the contents of a file. When you say generic here, what we mean is that it's up to the user how they're going to use that format. The content and the way that content will be structured is entirely up to the user. And the file format just provides a way that many users are familiar with. And as we said, it's communicated through the extension. We've seen a text file, which is just a raw text with no particular structure. A CSV file is a file which has got comma separated values, which is what the CSV stands for. What that means is that you're basically storing a table of data and you separate each column using a comma and when you're processing a csv file you have to then split each row at the comma there is an alternative to this which is called the tsv file which is where you have tab separated values and as before you just split on the tab character xml stands for extensible markup language and that defines a file that has tags which define a, a tree structure of the data, hierarchical structure of the data. JSON is, stands for JavaScript Object Notation and is used to store JavaScript objects. They are literally JavaScript objects, but these are very readable and easy to understand. They look like Python dictionaries, so they are not Python dictionaries. And Python has a very nice library called JSON that allows you to uh, read data and convert it into JSON. We know PDF files, those are the ubiquitous form of storing documents in a portable way. JPG, JPEG is another generic format. You can write your own JPEG files. Typically, we'll do that by taking a photo with our device or scanning a document. The same thing with PNG and MP3 files. So these are generic formats. Anyone who has, has got an MP3 file would typically also have an MP3 player, which can then uh, read that data. So Whenever you have generic formats, what you'll, you'll tend to have is applications, generic applications, or many applications are able to read this kind of data. That's what a file format is. Now, if you want to be more specific, there is something called a file schema. A file schema is an exact way, as opposed to a generic way for a format, and a file schema is a gen an exact way to organize the contents of a file for a very particular purpose. Now, if you, for example, let's take the example of a PDF file. If you wanted to have a PDF file that was for a very particular purpose, let's say applying for a job, let's say you had a job website and the PDF had to be structured in a certain way, they'd probably give you a template that you fill in. 
then they'll be able to extract just what they need from that fire. Perhaps the most popular, everybody knows this, though they, they, I don't know if people tinker under the hood, there's what's called the HTML schema. HTML is the files that we have on our browser. The HTML schema is a particular type of XML. So XML, as we said, was a file format, generic, anybody can use XML, but HTML is very specific and has to, every HTML file has to have certain tags. Let's look at an example of this. So this is a simple HTML file, which is, is conforms to the HTML schema. It has got tags, HTML, there's an opening and closing tag, for a document to be valid HTML, it must have a head as well and a body. The body is where all the content goes to. So what you view whenever you're viewing a web page, that's all in the body tag. There are other tags that go in there. There are divs, there are paragraphs, there are unstructured lists, there are um, ordered lists, and unordered lists and, and ordered lists. And there's just very many kinds of tags. And then you, you could also include styling and JavaScript for dynamic content. You know what, let's actually look at what that, what that looks like by looking at an actual HTML page. So this is the pathlib documentation on Python. We're going to look at this later on this morning. And if we right click, you'll see an option there called view page source. The view page source, in my case, is opened in a new tab. And, and it shows you the HTML that is associated with that page. And as you notice here, you have got the HTML tag right at the, to at the top. You have a head tag, which has got a lot of content. It's got some, it's got the title. You see here, we have the character set that's used for this. This is explicitly defined. This is what I was saying, where you could specify it explicitly. There's a title there. Then you have a bunch of links. You have scripts, JavaScript files. You have some styling, um, you have more scripts. Then you have the body tag, and the body is where you have all the divs, the headers, the unordered lists with the lists, the anchors for links, and so on and so forth. And this is all the content of the page. And there's a lot of stuff that goes into this, but that's your HTML document. So your standard HTML document, uh, you could, it will have that that um, schema will conform to that schema. So then let's also talk about standard files. So if you're writing um, any Python program, there will be the Python provides access to three files, which are called standard files, which allow you to interact with the system. The standard in, which is typically the keyboard, is the way in which you receive input from the outside world into your program. We saw this in week two where we looked at the input input function which we have used throughout. The input function is actually um, directly connected to standard in and it typically will be your keyboard. So your keyboard provides a way for data to get into your program. Standard out is uh, anytime you run the print function it will print out to the terminal and you are using the standard out file. These are actual files that the operating system provides to your program to allow you to communicate with the, with, with the, with the outside world. And anytime you have errors, all the exceptions and any explicit errors that you call in your program, they will be expressed through the standard error file. So that is also a file. We can use this by specifying the file argument on the print function. So we've covered a lot. We've looked at what a file is. Uh, we've looked at some of the properties of files. Files have got a name, they've got a location, they've got an extension, um, they've got um, permissions, they have an owner. We've, we've looked at, uh, we've done some uh, um, tinkering around, around on the terminal. We have looked at file formats, file schemas, what different, um, we've looked at text and binary files, and we've looked at these standard files. So let's now look at some practical parts of working with files. So we're going to look at working with files in Python. So for this, I'm going to switch back now to, to PyCharm.
So let me close the terminal. And so let's get started with working with files. I need to, I have a file here for files. I have a stub of the content for today. Okay, so if you want to deal with files, there is a simple conventional way of Oh, I need to close that. Oh, that's not closing. I don't know why that's not closing. I okay, there we go. Ah. <laughs> okay, that's it. It's trying to close that. For you to work with files, you need to use the open function. The open function takes a number of parameters. It takes the file name. It takes a mode and there are many other parameters. The other parameters depend on what type of file and what you want to do with the file or how you're going to handle the content of the file. Every file has got, every file, whenever you open a file, what you return is a file object. So let's look at that literally. So here we have um, the function. I'm going to write, I'm going to write another one here. So let's just. Okay, uh, my, my terminal is, my screen is very slow today. Okay, so we're going to open the war and peace file, war and peace. So PyCharm can see that I have that. And we're going to specify the mode as read. And when we open that, let's see what that gives us. We're going to print out what the object is. Let's clean that up. And let's run that. So yeah, it used to be very straightforward what you would get when you print this out. But Python 3 now organized the file classes into an, a package called IO, which is for input output. And then the classes that are specified there are then what, what you what it is actually using behind the scenes. So when we opened this file, what we got was an IO text IO wrapper with a name war and peace dot text with a mode read and the default encoding, we didn't specify any encoding, but the default encoding was UTF-8. Now that sounds like a mouthful. If you want, you could spend some time going through the IO library. I wouldn't waste my time with that, but if we just peruse that and see what the different classes are there. But let's see what the type of F is. This is probably more useful for us. It says it's an IO, text IO wrapper. So that's just basically, this is a text file. It's a wrapper to a text file. By wrapper, what it means, it's, it's just hiding the complex um, implementation details away from you so that all you know is you're dealing with a file. It's a file object for all intents and purposes. Whenever you open a file, you must close it. Now, you can get away with not closing it, but if you run your program so many times, what ends up happening is you end up littering your operating system with a lot of open files. And typically, the operating system has a limit on how many open files it can have. So there's, you have to always close files. At some point, if you keep on running the program, you might get to the point where it will then warn you that you have too many open files and you have to close them and that's going to just be a, a nightmare to deal with. So it's far, far, it's just good practice. Always close a file whenever you open it. So nothing happens, but that just makes sure that you have a nice clean close. So let's look at a number of things here. One is you specify the file name and you specified the mode. In this case, we are doing a read there are a number of defaults which we haven't specified, but we've just said we want to read the file. It will assume that it is a text file. And uh, if we exclude the read, then it will also assume that we are reading. So this again will also work. So that, that ran without a problem. Um, maybe just to make sure that um, the type of file is 
so that we can see that it's actually run. Okay, then. So you see that that has run actually there. Okay. So we talked about the file opening modes. There are a number of ways you can open a file. We've just looked at how to open the file by, by specifying read. We've done that with war and peace. Well, why don't we do that with the image file? And now we are going to specify that it's a binary file. So we're going to do something slightly different. So we're going to say f is equals to open image. It's going to recognize that we have the image file. But we're going to tell it that we're going to open it in binary mode. And as before, we want to make sure that we close the file. And we're going to print the type of F. And we'll see that this will be something different. That's exactly one append mode at most one plus. Ah, yes. So if we, are, if we are reading a binary file, we have to specify that we are reading, okay? Now, this is a different, if you notice, this is a different file. The type of file, uh, now we are saying it's an IO buffered reader. And that's just basically that this is a, a binary file. But I think B stands for buffer, if not binary, I'm not sure. Uh, that's just an interesting thing. I don't know why didn't they say that it's a binary file. But either way, this is a, we've read a binary file there, we've opened it and we've closed it. We can also append to a file and we are going to do something, we are going to do something completely new here for our, our own new file. So first of all, let's imagine that we have a file. We open the file. Uh, before we append, let's first of all write. So we are going to write to a file called myfile.txt. This is going to be a text file. And we are going to write to the file. We want to see an example of, of doing an append. And we are going to write to the file. So I just want to illustrate what append looks like. So f.write, and we're going to write hello. And then we close the file. And then we're going to view the contents of the file. So if we run that, nothing should happen. But we will now go to our terminal. Let me just minimize this one. I'll clear that. So we have a file, we have a new file called my file, which is there, which we've just created. And we can head my file. And when we head it, what do you see? It's just got the letters hello. And you notice it doesn't even have a new line at the end. It's just hello. Now we let's see what it, what happens when we append to the file. So f dot f is equals to open my file dot text and now we are going to open it with let's see what happens um, i'm actually not sure what happens if you say append only uh, this should be okay and we're going to say f dot write world i'll put a space and i'll put a new line at the end and then we're going to close it f dot close and let's run that again. So that has run successfully. And let's see what happens. If now we say head my file. Now we see that it has world. It, it doesn't affect what was there before. It now added the space, the word world, and the new line. So which is why we have our, our cursor, our prompt is returned at this point. Okay. Okay, so that's how we specify the mode with the read mode, the write mode, the append mode. We've looked at the binary mode and by default we are always assuming it's a it's text mode. So when, when whenever we wrote um W, we are actually saying WT, we are specifying text. And when we said A, we are specifying it's a text file as well. There's an implied T there. Okay. Now, notice here, we all the time we kept saying we have to open and we have to close. Now, this is where the compound structure comes in, the with context manager. And the reason, as we said, is, probably not said this before, but 
we always want to make sure that the file is closed. Now what happens if you have code like this? So f is equal to, I'll make this a comment, just let me make it a multi-line comment. So suppose you had something like f is equals to open and the name of the file, um, uh, file.txt and you are reading from that file and you had a lot of lines of code so you had some you know line one line two oh, my screen is very slow i don't know why and so on let's say you had 100 lines here okay so you had line now you had line let's say 100 okay and then you say f dot close what happens if you have an exception on line 50? Well, if you have an exception on line 50, then your program will be terminated at that point and you will not get to the point of close. So the file will remain open. And if you run this a thousand times, you have a thousand open handles to that file. That's not good. And the solution to this is with using the width context manager. What well, the width context manager is, it provides a context within, the, within which the file is used. And any exception that happens guarantees that the file is closed at the exception. And this is how we write it. We say with open some file.txt. Okay, maybe we should use, uh, let's use my file. The file we had just created my file the text and we are assuming it's we are reading it in text mode as f colon uh, this is uh, the way we always distinguish the different blocks we use a colon and now we have a variable called f available so we can print f here and anything all the lines of code that happen in here if we have an exception for the file the file will then be closed correctly, regardless of which exception it is. So this just provides a nice clean way for us to, to make sure that the file is always closed. So always use a with context handler whenever you work with files. In as much as these are available, these are the old way of doing things, but the right way of doing things is to use the with context manager. So, so far we've just been reading files. Now let's see how to, uh, we've just been playing around with opening and closing files. But now let's actually read some data from a file. There are three methods available for this. There is the read, there is the read line, and there is the read lines. Read will read everything. So let's do this with open, war and peace, again, as a text file in read-only mode by, by default, so we know that we'll not mess the file when we do this, as f, and we'll say data is equal to f.read. This will read everything, and we can then print the length of data. So if we run that, I'll close the terminal now. It tells us, it gives us a number. Let's just run that again. It reads everything and gives us the size of the data. And that's 3 million somethings. I don't know what those are. We'd, we'd have to figure out. I think that's 3 million characters. I'm actually surprised. That's actually quite small. I didn't know War and Peace is so small. 3 million characters. Well, we can figure out what the data is by printing, let's say, the first 100. So if you print data using a slice, 100, well, it's actually the characters. The Project Gutenberg ebook of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy. So these are 100 characters. So there are actually 3 million characters in the book, which is surprisingly few given how big the book is. So that's read 
the read method. Read method just gives you everything in the file. The read line method, on the other hand, does something slightly different. And let's see what that does. So again, we're going to open war and peace. Now notice, because we are now, we've gotten out of that context handler, the file has been closed. And so we can open it again. So war and peace again as F. If you'll notice, I usually use F. For the name of the for the file object because it's quite straightforward and you find that in a lot of code so that's that's okay data is equals to f dot read line let's let's just make sure that this i hope this is working correctly um print data mm. so if you run that what do we notice well we notice so this is a line here so I'll say this is uh, f dot read line. And this is f dot read. So that we can distinguish one from the other. So f dot read here tells us the number of. So that was f dot read, and f dot read line here just give us one line. So what it will do is it's going to, it's going to go as far as. Let's look at this from the documentation. So docs dot python dot org slash library slash um, functions. We look at the arguments of the open. So there are a number of arguments. So the file, the default mode is reading, buffering, it's set to minus one encoding, and so on and so on. But there is a new line. There is a specification of what new line is. So new line is, I think it's dependent. So new line controls how universal new lines works, and it depends on the operating system. It depends on a number of things. So when writing out, when reading input from the stream, if new line is none, universal new line mode is enabled. So that means it's going to, it'll treat them specially. New line controls how universal new line mode works. By default, if you're running this on Linux, new line will just be the backslash n. And backslash n is used to separate each line. So what you're seeing, the behavior that you're seeing here, even if we have specified the default is set to none, on the, the default for a new line is set to none, it will then use the system new line and that's specified somewhere. You can actually even get it. Sys dot, I think it's OS dot new line defines what new line is. But what then happens is it will then only read one line at a time. It will read all the way up to the, where it finds that new line character and only return that data. And that's exactly what it's done. Read line returns one line at a time, which is actually a string. Um, I should say also that this is everything and this is everything as a string, but it depends on what type of file it was. If it was a binary file, it'll just read all the binary data. If it's a text file, it'll read all the, the, the text data as string according to that encoding and it'll read it into Python as uh, Unicode. And last but not least is the read lines. Let's see what that does. And that gives you a list. So with open war uh, this is really annoying and peace as f data is equals to f dot read lines and we'll see, let's, this is going to be interesting print f dot read lines and we see the length of data. What do we expect this to be? Well, let's try and figure this out from the name of the, the method. Read lines should read the lines. So it will give us lines. It gives us a list. So 
read lines should give us a number much, much smaller than this 3 million value here we have here. We expect it to be, let's assume a sentence has got 10 words, or a line has got, let's say, roughly 10 words. We expect this to be a roughly in the order of 300,000 instead of 3 million. So let's run that and just check. Well, yeah, so it, you see it's even much smaller. <laughs> so we've got 66,000. And those are actual lines. So if we looked at the first two lines, let's see what it prints. So if we print uh, data and we just got um, um, two, because we know these are long lines. So you see that it, it, it actually has, let me close this annoying thing. It has, there's a funny character there, which is some Unicode, but that is one line. And notice it's, it ends with a new line character. So the new line characters is retained. The next line is blank because all it has is a new line character. And if you wanted more, we would see more. I mean, we could, let's, let's maybe look at the five lines. And if you run that, so yeah, you see there are multiple lines here now. So this ebook is for use of anyone, ends with new line. Most other parts of the world at no cost with almost no restrictions, new line. Uh, whosoever, you may copy it, give it away or reuse it under the terms, new line. So there we go. Let's just clean this up. So you've seen a number of things. One is we'll, we have now started using the with context manager to, to make sure that our files always get closed we've seen three ways of reading from a file which gives us different data depending on what we are doing we've looked at writing to a file but let's let's look at it in a bit more detail and this time we're going to use a with context manager so there are two ways to write to a file you could use write as we used before and if you noticed whenever we use write it doesn't end up with a new line at the end so then we have to add that explicitly so with open some file dot text and we want to write to this and it's in text mode by default as f so you have to specify that it's right so f dot write we can take some text let's copy some text from here this ebook And then we have to put a new line at the end, f dot write. And the other way we could do this is we could use a print function. So let's take, let's say, another line. It's a project Gutenberg, like Leo Tolstoy. This one will include new lines automatically because the print function has a new line specified automatically, if you recall from. So print the, the end is automatically specified as new line. So we'll get that for free. Um, we don't need to add that, but we need to specify that the file is F. F, yes. Otherwise it will write it to the, the screen. Okay, so if we run that, we don't see anything. Uh, file, sorry, that's a typo. Okay, so we now let's check just to make sure that this exists. We're looking for a file called some file. So we have some file there. We can head some file. And some file has exactly what we want. We have two lines because we had a new line and we used print. The ebook is for the use of anyone. The Project Gutenberg ebook of War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy. So that's how we write to a file. Now, this is now a tricky one. You can actually navigate through a file. When we navigate through a file, we can specify exactly where to be in the file. There are two methods that are available for this. There is the tell method, which is used to tell you where you are. Um, where am I in the file? And then there is the seek method, which is 
how to get to a certain particular location. So go to a particular location. The results of using this are, they are new, it uses numbers for the positions within the file. So let's look at this practically. And this is very powerful when you're, if you want to, you know, not play around with a file such that you can move back to the beginning and back to the end and you can write at the beginning and write at the end. And there are fancy things you could do with that. And it, it, it could be useful depending on what you want to do. But um, it's good practice to have. So we're going to, we're going to create a new file. Um, I'll just call it new file. Dot text. And we're going to write to it. <clears throat> as if now we have nothing in this file so we're going to write something to it and at the end of the writing process we're going to ask where we are okay actually you know what let's use a file we already have and we're going to open it so we're going to use the sum file we just created and we're going to use, work with it in append mode <laughs> okay so this should be fun. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to find out where we are. So where are we in the file? And we're going to use the FTL. So we'll say uh, print f.tel. So this should be interesting. Um, we say we are at position and then we have FTL here. So if we run that now, it will give us some interesting result. It says we are at position 99. So because we opened it in append mode, we are going to append, we are adding at the, at the end we are then going to be at the end of the file. In order for us, to, so let's, let's, there's an interesting command that can give us a bit of insight of what's going on here. So we might get a bit confused, but there is a command called WC, WC, which is called the word count command. What this allows us to do is to see the, the details about our file. So if we do word count, word count some file, it's going to tell us a number of things. It tells us how many lines we have in the file. There are two lines. It tells us how many words we have in the file. There are 20. And it tells us how many characters we have in the file. 99. Now we can understand why we are at position 99. It's because position 99 is the end. Since it's an append file, we are going to be positioned at the end. What if when we open the file, we rewound the file to the beginning. So we'll say f.seek and we'll go to the beginning, which is zero. Remember in Python, we'll always count to zero. And then we, we repeat exactly this call here, but we call this after. And when we run that, now it tells us we are at position 99, we f-seek zero, and now we are at position zero. So now we can do some dangerous things. We can actually write something new there. So we can f dot write. It writes at the position that we are at. So we'll write hello world. And we can even add a new line. Let's see what this does. So we start off with position 99. We go to zero. When we say that we are at position zero, and then we write something else with a new line. Now let's run the word count again and see what we, we get. So now something has changed. Now we have three lines because we added a new line. Okay. Now we have 22 words because we added the two words, hello world. And now we have 111 characters because hello world has got five plus five plus five plus one, which is 11 on top of the 99. So that's 110 plus the new line, 111. So you have 111 characters in the file. 
And if we head this file, we actually see that now we've... Oh, that is weird. No, I didn't expect that. Oh, that is strange. That is very strange. I didn't expect that at all. I expected it to write at the beginning. But it wrote at the end. So this is a very important property about appending. Append is faithful to make sure that you will only append to the end. Since you open the file in append mode, it will always rewind back to the end. If we had opened it in write mode, then then it should have done something different. In fact, there's another mode called um, for updating. And let's, let's just actually see that. Hmm. So, so these are the different modes here. So you can open for reading, open for writing and truncating the file first, open for exclusive creation and so on. There's append binary text mode. This is a default open for updating, reading and writing. So if we now repeat this code here, but instead of using append, we use the plus. So we are going to replace, but now with plus, I expect that it's going to be different. So let's run that. Uh, must have exactly one of create read. Ah, okay then. So we have to say append. Ah, okay then. So let's say append plus. Okay, let's try that again. Okay, so that seems to have worked. <laughs> okay. Okay. And now let's see. We repeat this head. No, it doesn't. It just adds it. Okay. What if we said read plus? It's lovely. I mean, I love discovering. <laughs> now, that's what I wanted to happen. I wanted to write hello world right at the beginning. So we move to the beginning. So that's how you would move around and modify the content of the file as you. But the key takeaway here is the seek and the tell. Seek will move to that position and tell will tell you where you are. So you can use tell to check where you are. Now, one of the things that um, you should be aware of is that files are like, like um, you know, when you use map or filter, it gives you a map object, which is actually a generator, but it, get, it gets exhausted. And the same thing, files get exhausted. So if you read a file and you read it till the end, and then you, you've reached the end, and then you try and read some more, there'll be nothing at the end. So you might have to rewind the file, which is where the seek comes in. So these are handy if you need to read through a file multiple times in one processing. So just put a note of that. So f.tell and f.seek help to re-navigate, to, to like go back to the end uh, after reading after reading through. Uh, okay. So there we go. Now, there are a number of exceptions that you can get. Um, there's a file exists exception and there's a file not found exception. I think this is the easier one to start with. Let's start with the file not found. That's very easy. You say with open a non-existent file, non-existent file.txt, we open it in read mode as f, print f, and that should give us, that should raid, raise an exception of a file not found. If you want to get a file exists error, that, that's then you would need to, for the exclusive creation, for example. So we use the x mode with open, we already have a file here called some file.txt but we say we want to open it exclusively for for working with as f print f that should then raise 
Um, so I have to hide this to see the other exception. Uh, it says file exists error. There are more errors and these are provided in your notes. So you'll see a lot more detail. There are other exceptions that are handy. So at this point, I'll just pause and ask, do we have, we have one question here. What is the meaning of at when you type ls minus l? So does this occur at the end? This is usually at the end, right? Uh, right at the end. I'm not sure actually. Uh, image when piece. I don't know what that means, but we can, you know what? Let's just do a search of what that means ls at meaning mm, so Linux mm, bash ls meaning of at I don't know, how should we search for this? Yeah, okay, so here is on stack of stack exchange. So what does the at sign? At least you can do this to show more information. Hmm. If you know the meaning and you can link it in the description below, but it's not as obvious as I thought, as easy to find. I'm using this when I type it, I see something like this. What does the at mean? It indicates that the file has extended attributes. Oh, okay then. So you can use the x atta command utility to view and modify them. Oh, okay. So that's what it means. So let's see. X atta. I, I didn't know this at all. So this is a good question. War in peace. Okay. So this tells us something about the file. And these are not available on the sum file. So let's see that. Add a sum file. Nothing. Okay, so that's what it means. I don't know if you have it. Do you have it on Linux? That's fine. Okay, then. Well, we can check afterwards. But, but anyway, we've learned something new. So it means that there are extra attributes. Very good. Great question. Okay, so that covers it for so that covers it for files. We've looked at how to open a file. Uh, we've looked at the methods available, how to read, how to write, how to navigate within the file, about permissions. We've seen some exciting things about permissions. And then we've looked at the with context manager. So now let's look at paths. Paths are very, very important to understand because files don't exist on a flat structure, they live in a hierarchical structure. And this is presented to us in what's called the file system. So the file system is the organization through which the files are then are accessible to the user. So as we've seen, the file system will have files and the file system will also have folders. These are also called directories. Folders and directories are exactly the same thing. It's just an interchangeable name for them. So this gives us a hierarchy so you can have a folder can contain another folder, which can contain files, and so on and so forth. And you can have um, a very complicated structure. This is usually where chaos comes from. Chaos comes from having too wild a folder structure, because it's then very easy to lose things. You can imagine if you have a folder with 10 folders, and each of those 10 folders have got 10 folders, you've, you've, you've quickly reached 100 folders. So finding something within one folder means you have to search. It's quite tedious. I like to have things on flat structures um, with a maximum depth of maybe three. Anything beyond that, um, you're just having a recipe for, for chaos. The path describes the full sequence of directories to get to a directory or a file. For example, to access the binary for the executable for python this is found at usr slash bin slash python so this is a python path uh, um, um, linux path 
on windows they will be use backslash and they will be pre they will be begin with the name of the drive letter and okay there are two types of paths there are relative paths and absolute paths relative paths will begin with either a period a double period or two periods or a tilde tilde is refers to the home directory so the user's home directory if you are logged in every logged in user on a linux system will have a home directory and that's where they would have you know their default write permissions that's where they would have um, a bunch of important files that define like how they log in and and um, where they download things to for example we saw dot and dot dot before dot refers to the current directory and dot dot refers to the parent directory on windows the absolute directory begins with a drive letter so you might have c d e f or whatever you have on linux and mac or unix you're going to start with a forward slash you can combine them you can have a combined um relative and absolute path and, but it obviously will have to start with an absolute path and then you could then have a bunch of relative paths so let's look at this in practice so i'm going to do this right here i'll close this one so that we can have so i, I have i have created uh, as we saw before i've already created there are a number of files and folders here but we have a special folder there called cold I created it using random words so um, there's a very handy utility provided on Linux I don't know if it's available on Windows and it's called tree and tree allows you to show a tree shows you the hierarchy of how folders are arranged so if I say tree and the name of the folder it prints out in a nice easy to understand format the structure of that folder so we have cold which has got two folders pillow and treatment Pillow has got a folder called deficit, which has a file called war and peace. Treatment has got a file called image.jpg. The, um, the path, so if you wanted to find the path uh, to war and peace, the path would be specified, in this case I'm on Linux, I'll use a relative path. I could say explicitly, I want to list what's inside this current folder cold slash pillow slash deficit and war and peace and that's the full path to that file usually we omit the first folder oh sorry 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 um so as i said okay then use a tree command the tree command and the name of the folder so in this case i said tree and cold which was the name of the folder let me just scroll up a little. So the folder was called, is called cold and I say tree cold and I can then see that structure. And I can then list the content of one of those uh, directories by specifying the full path. Cold, pillow, deficit, war and peace. Cold, pillow, deficit, war and peace. Now you can actually exclude the dot slash at the beginning when you're working with folders. So instead of saying dot slash cold, I can simply say um, just the name of the folder like that. Another important mm, command is the PWD. PWD stands for the present working directory and it shows us a full path from the root. So the root here is users, Paul Career, PyCharm projects, PL1C, week seven. And I could do that for a file. Um, I don't know, is it called abs path? No, no, it's not abs path. Um, the name. Cold, oh no, that just gives you the directory name. Okay, dot, okay. But the PWD will give you the, the path, the absolute path up to the present. And you can stick them together using, if you wanted to, you could say ls and you could use backtick, PWD, backtick, slash, cold. Uh, 
cold. Oh, where am I? Ah, okay then. Yeah, it's getting confused. PWD bucktick dot slash cold. Hmm. Why is it not? Okay then. It's it can't do the. I would have to do it cold, pillow, deficit. So this is just now. Just um, I'm being senseless. PWD. And that doesn't print out the full path. So there we've used backtick. We'll just return the string that you from computing that command. So if ls and then pw. Pw gives us all of that. Backtick just and allows us to take the string output of running the pw command. So let's just see what else do I want to show you. Yeah, you can combine uh, relative and absolute. So for example, I can say ls of let's do this cold pillow deficit and then i realize oh my goodness i want to go back dot dot which goes back and that is deficit so i want to go back again uh, so there are how many are there i can go back out again and now if i use double tab i see there's another option treatment so you see what i've done here is i'm using a mixture of using the path and then I use the relative path to go out again, treatment. Well, this is senseless, but I just want to illustrate how you can do this. And you can do this also from the absolute path. There are examples in your notes that show you how, how this works. So does that, I think that covers everything about relative path and absolute path. No, let me just show you about tilde. So tilde is, if I did ls tilde, Tilde is my, my directory, so you see files in my directory. I can, um, can I make it, I can put the name, I think. The name is another command that uh, users, oh, that's, ah, okay then, yeah, okay. So, Tilde is just the name of my, my directory. Since I am Paul Courier, it'll, I'll have users Paul Courier. If it's Linux, it'll be home slash username. So, yeah, so I can access anything in here by just using the tilde. Instead of having to type users home, I can just use tilde as a shorthand for that. So, if I wanted to get into the downloads directory and I wanted to head, let's say, a certain file, or let's say ls, um, I want to go to downloads, and I only want to see, so I can do what's called a pipe. A pipe means I take the output of one command, and pass it to another command. What I then I can say head, which means I'm just looking at the top values of this output. So it shows me the head of of these files. So you have three little pigs cut in stock. Well, you know, there's a lot of <laughs> useless stuff here. But this just shows you my home directory. I get the downloads folder. I'm using ls and I pipe this to the head command. So there's a lot of things I'm showing you here today. Okay, so that's it about relative paths and absolute paths. Now let's do this in Python. Let's do a few of these interesting in Py things in Python. Now we're going to do this in Python. We're going to use the pathlib library. This is a relatively new library. Um, it was added, I don't know when it was added, but previously I used to use what, what's called os.path, but... This is a, I think this is a, this was added in version 3.4. And the whole idea behind the pathlib direct uh, library is that it's, I've got an object oriented approach um, to handling file system paths. There's some useful documentation, but I'll just skip to the main parts on how to use it. There's a class there called path, and that's what you use for everything. So let's see how to work with the path class. Um, okay, so the first thing you're going to do, as with any other Python, is you're going to import the pathlib. So you need to import, okay, sorry, if I clean that up, it just deletes it immediately. <laughs> I have to use it for it to not clean it away. So there's pathlib, and then I'm going to create a pathlib object. So I'll just call um, 
path is equals to path lib dot path. And I'll specify that this path refers to the current directory. Remember dot refers to the current directory. You can even see it's already recognized the content of that directory. And then let's print out and see what this is. So we're going to print path and the type of path. No, not that path. Ah, oh, this is so slow. I don't know why. Okay then. So let's run that. So when we run that, it tells us the path, that's current path is that location. And the object is a path leave POSIX path. What it's basically saying is that this is a certain type of path. If you saw from the documentation, there were different types of paths, but using the path class just hides all those hidden things that we don't need to know about. And, but you can read the documentation and find out. But in specifically, I have what's called a POSIX path as opposed to a Windows path. So now when I have a path object, there are a number of things I can do on that. We can use the slash operator now the slash operator makes it very easy for us to understand paths. It means we can, we can create a new path, which is the path slash, just the way you do it on the command line. And you could put the name of a file, sum file dot text. That should give you a new path object. So print new path type new path and if you run that it says that this new path is it's no longer dot now it is some file so path refers to this file and you see we have very easily navigated just by using the the slash operator let's clean that up just make things look neat okay then so there are a number of methods available on path. We can find the name of a path. So we can say print. And these are all available if we look at the methods. Let me just scroll down. Uh, pure path. They'll usually be specified against pure path. There's pure windows path, operators. And this section here, so there's the drive, but that applies for windows. In this case, drive will usually be empty for Linux. There's the root, the anchor, but then you have all these attributes. There's the anchor, parents, parent, and name. So let's use name, print new path dot name. Oh, okay, that's going to fail. Okay, so the name is just the name of the file. We can find the parent of this. So we can print new path dot parent. Notice there are two of them. There is parent and there is parents and they do different things. You need to be clear what the distinction is. We can also see the full path all the way till the beginning. So we can say print new path dot abs path absolute and that will print a much longer thing which is that one there and you can check if a, a path exists so let's create a new path for a file so some imaginary file for example we just want to show what it will say we'll say other path as you can see, it's very straightforward working with the pathlib library. You just have to give a name to a path. You can extend the, 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 the path and so on. So other path is equals to pathlib.path. And we shall say that this refers to a file which is in the present directory called nothing.txt. Now we know that doesn't exist. And 
so print so first of all notice that it will not complain that the path doesn't exist until we evaluate it as a path and the reason for this is because you can use the path to create a file so look what it says it says that it's fine there's nothing wrong you have just told us that this is a path and it exists in the local directory that's fine but now let's check whether it exists if we say print other path dot exists and when we run this it says it doesn't exist and we can create it now so we can then use what we learned from before with open it's actually not open we'd say with other path dot open so open you now can specify the mode so it's write text okay as this is interesting i wonder if it closes it automatically let's just say it's at f let's just carry on with what we did from before so f dot write um there is nothing here and we run that with my typo and then we now check to see whether it exists print other path and we run that now it says it does so it will say it does from the beginning um, because you saw before that it said that it did exist so we could delete the file afterwards we could say something like um, we could use the method unlink so we could say other path dot unlink this will delete it unlink so so now when you run it it will say true true and if you run it again it will say false true because it will every time we run it we will unlink it or delete it unlink means just pluck it out of the file system the other thing we can check is whether a path is a directory um, there are many other methods that you could use um, so this, you can check whether the path is absolute relative is reserved you can join path to another path you can use matching using what are called regular expressions um, concrete path so this is what we are actually working on now and the methods on that current working directory start chmod exists glob and this is what we are looking at now is directory is file is mount is symlink and you can examine um, all of these so let's say we know that this is false print other path is there and we know that that is false so that is false now what's really cool is you can also make directories so let's make a, a new dir is equals to path lib and we're going to create a directory we'll call it what um chips for example i'm just using something off the top of my head uh, so first of all we create the name dot chips and then we can check whether it exists print new dir exists we know that is false as you can see right at the bottom there um, but we can now create it we can say new dir dot make dir uh, mkdir and this is also a command on linux mkdir as you notice a lot of the commands in python tend to mirror what's in linux which is one of the reasons why I would really encourage you to make sure you have a Linux system running somewhere. And now if we check if the new dir exists, uh, and we run that, it's going to create the directory and say now that it's, it's true. Obviously the next time we run it, this false will become true. So we can remove that directory to make sure that it's always, always gives us the right values. Okay. I think that brings us to the end of, everything we've looked at the path class we've looked at the slash operator and we've looked at a number of methods there are so many more methods please play around with them and just 
uh, get a good grasp of what's going on. We've looked at files and we've looked at paths. We've covered a lot of ground. There are all the notes for today are available in the class material. So you're going to have everything you need to understand how to work with, um, with, with the files and paths. There's also extra material there. I've included a section of a number of Python libraries that can help you work with files. Um, there's a struct library we talked about. There's the IO that we looked at, which specifies the classes that are used for files, the text wrapper, buffered reader. There are also JSON, which is used for reading JSON. There are libraries for co uh, and compression. There are libraries for encoding. There are libraries that include um, internet data handling. Um, and there's a lot when it comes to files. A lot of the power of working with programs comes to be, with being able to process files. And being able to work with files is absolutely essential. You can't work with files if you can't work with paths. This, they go together hand in hand. So that brings us to the end of this class. It brings us to the end of the Python level one course, at least as far as the class material is concerned. There is a mini project which you're going to, um, for the tutored students, you're going to have access to. And that's um, the only thing that remains now is for you to test yourself, find out whether you have grasped the core ideas. This is a very simple test. It just asks you the top level questions. It's not difficult. The quizzes are more demanding. Uh, the quiz has got a lot of material today, so um, take a look at that when you do have the time. And thank you for being part of the Python Level 1 course. The Python Level 2 course is still being prepared and that will cover classes. There's going to be a Python Level 3 which will now take you through advanced material, uh, dealing with multiple processors, writing multi-threading applications, and doing some things like metaprogramming, um, decorators and some advanced topics that can help you take it to another level but you have to go through the Python level 2 first, Python level 3. There will be a skill builder associated with each level of the course. There will be a skill builder 2 and a skill builder 3 and each of them will have um, 10 challenges in 10 weeks. The idea is to build strength. You have now, you have laid the foundation now we want to erect the walls and make sure that the walls are nice and firm and strong. So thank you for being with me and I look forward to taking you through the next classes. Take care and God bless.